In this lecture, we're continuing uh, our discussion <coughs> about the multiple linear regression. And uh, uh, next stop is, uh, let's talk about how well this model that we built in the previous lecture fits the data. Okay. Uh, in um, lecture <coughs> about the uh, simple linear regression, we discussed that the most popular way probably to characterize how nicely the linear model fits the data uh, is the R squared. Okay, where do we find R squared? So here is our model summary, the output. And in the output you will find multiple R squared, that's the one that we used in simple linear regression right here. Okay, so let's first of all interpret, uh, again I'm going to remind you how this value is interpreted. The generic interpretation of uh, R squared is uh, it gives you the percentage of variability in your target variable which is explained by and attributed to the variability in your predictors that's generic interpretation so in our specific case <coughs> uh, the R squared value is roughly speaking 39.4 so um, Within the context of this uh, specific problem, I could say that about 39.4% of variability in uh, students' university GPAs is explained by and attributed to the variability of predictors, meaning specifically high school GPA, um, SAT scores, and the number of activity hours in the ex extracurriculum program. <coughs> so, um, that means that our three independent variables, high school GPA, SAT, and activity hours, together collectively, uh, explain about 40%, um, roughly speaking, of variation uh, from student to student in terms of their university junior year GPA. <coughs> so, it's not a terrible model, uh, but clearly, obviously, uh, there is room for improvement because it explains only 40 percent of variation in gpas so that means that 60 percent of variability uh, is not explained by this model right it's attributed to something else to things that are not included in this model such as for example <coughs> uh, majors possible right from major to major people will get different grades uh, variations by gender variations by affiliation with um, different societies, or uh, you know, fraternities, sororities. Um, <coughs> uh, the variability can be also introduced by the fact that some students are athletes and some are not athletes. Um, it could be caused by uh, working part time, right? If people work part time, then they they have less time for studies, right? Working part time can be linked with financial situation, so therefore. Um, uh, financial aid could be another predictor. So there are a lot of things that are not included in this model, right? So therefore, <coughs> we can say that yes, the model is not bad, but it's not great either. Um, but here is the ironic piece, okay? <coughs> Obviously, the more variables I include in the model, the better the model becomes, right? That's what we can expect, just generally speaking. So, therefore, the general idea might be that, you know, the more predictors I uh, put into my variable, the more detailed it becomes, the more closely it models the reality, right? So, when I was using just the mileage to predict the car's prices, I was leaving um, outside of the model the vast majority of possible predictors, right? So, what else could predict the car price except the mileage? Well, um, can be number of accidents, number of owners, how old is the car, <coughs> then a uh, number of extra features such as leather seats, sunroof, um, you know, multi-disc CD changer, that, that kind of stuff can predict the price of the car, right? So, <coughs> my thinking might be that uh, the more variables I throw into the model, um, the better it becomes. And indeed, this is true, actually. Uh, but, uh, weirdly enough, if I add to the model a variable that has nothing to do with my target, and I know it has nothing to do with the target, the model will get better. 
okay and what do i mean by better the r squared will go up simple as that okay so because r squared is the measure of how well my model uh, fits fits the data i want to get r squared as high as possible reminder the r squared values are ranging from zero to plus one not from minus one but from zero to plus one zero is the absolutely worst model <coughs> worst model uh, plus one is absolutely the best model uh, neither of these extremes are practically encountered okay so we will never have a model with zero r squared and you will probably never have a model with uh, r squared which is uh, one okay you may come relatively close but it's never going to be perfect one so the closer to one the better so therefore uh, the thinking might be that you know I can actually make the model look very good uh, if I start adding more and more predictor variables into the model some of these variables can be useful and statistically significant some of them may not be useful but uh, each time when you add a new variable into the model the R squared goes up it can go up by a lot it can go up by a little bit teeny tiny microscopic value but um, that's the that's the reality okay more variables in the model higher r squared so therefore how do i build the perfect model i can artificially inflate that okay i can throw in quite literally hundreds maybe even thousands of models uh, of variables into the model each one of them probably most of them the majority of them is going to be um insignificant okay but each one of them will improve my r squared by 0 0.001 or something like this so if i throw enough variables to the model then at some point it will start looking really good that of course is the best is the is the bad practice right for example if i want to predict the stock price of microsoft on any given day i can include in my very in my model temperature in the city of newport news right <coughs> I know we all understand that temperature in Newport News has nothing to do, none whatsoever to do with price of Microsoft stock on any day. Okay? But if I do that, my R squared will go up. It will go up by a microscopic teeny tiny amount, but it will improve. Okay? So um, therefore what statisticians did is they um, modified R squared and they created a closely related but different measure which is called adjusted r squared and that's going to be our primary way how we can um, assess and uh, uh, evaluate how well the model fits our data so i'm not going to show you the formula it um, doesn't uh, have much of the educational value just to make you memorize the formula but adjusted r squared is computed from multiple r squared so uh, multiple r squared is part of the computation but also um, uh, as one of the variables that we have in the adjusted r squared is number total number of variables okay one of the components of adjusted r squared is total number of variables in the model and it's inversely proportional to the number of variables in the model okay so in other words what happens is this if i start going uh, bananas right I'm going ballistic on number of variables. So I'm you know, going in the overdrive and starting to throw into the model more and more and more junk variables that have nothing to do with my target, but my only reason is to try and make the R squared look good. Try to make it go higher. Okay? At some point in time, adjusted R squared will stop increasing actually. The multiple R squared will keep increasing. Okay, it never stops. So I add more one more variable, R squared goes up. I add another variable, R squared goes up, no matter what. Adjusted R squared behaves differently. First, as I start adding uh, important, significant variables into the model, adjusted R squared will, just like multiple R squared, it will go up. But <laughs> at some point in time, I'm going to start adding junk variables, right? I'm going to throw into the model uh, things that are not related to my target. Therefore, they shouldn't be in the model. Okay, doesn't have any value, doesn't make things more predictive. Uh, it only uh, complicates my, my model. Okay, uh, so 
at that point in time adjusted r squared will start going down it will say the improvement in multiple r squared is small so therefore i'm going to punish you for that okay so adjusted r squared essentially is a way for uh, for the model to say hey the variables that you're adding are not really contributing to anything okay so therefore you have to get rid of them so therefore uh, again to summarize right as i add more variables multiple r squared always go up no matter what it will always go up adjusted r squared will go up only as long as you're adding important statistically significant variables if you're adding a junk variable <coughs> that doesn't really improve multiple r squared by much adjusted r squared at that point will start going down and let me illustrate that okay so there is a reason why i discussed this uh significance statistical significance of a variable first so uh in the previous lecture we discussed which variables make a contribution to the model we found out that sat is not statistically significant right we saw it from the high p value okay that means that if i remove SAT from the model, it will not suffer a lot, right? So let me illustrate that. So what I'm going to do here is this. I will copy paste uh, this line of code right here, okay? That's my initial line that built me for me multiple linear regression. Let me go ahead and get rid of the SAT, okay? So how do I do that? I simply remove it from my model, right? Right. So right now my university GPA will be predicted based on the high school GPA and also number of activity hours. And I'm going to rerun this model. And now I'm going to show the summary of my multiple linear regression. Okay, so now before I do that, let's uh, review, right? My multiple R squared was 0.3939. My adjusted R squared was 0.375, right? So now I removed my uh, SAT variable and I rerun the uh, equation right the, the model first of all let me point out the equation will change okay so it's not just as simple as me removing that portion out of the equation and that's it okay your data has changed well your data didn't change but you're now using different number of predictors right so look at that what happened <coughs> that was my original equation right here right after I removed one of the variables, predictors, from my model, my intercept changed. You can see that visually, right? Intercept is different. The high school GPA slope is slightly different, right? 0.4463, now it's 0.447. Uh, my slope for activities is slightly different. So therefore, each time when you modify your predictors, change, you know, your, your set of predictors, uh, and rerun the model don't assume that it's just as simple as removing one term from the equation and that's it no your equation will change uh, and uh, you can see that i still have high school gpa as important variable right because p-value is small that one is still important variable significant because p-value is less than 0 0.05 so nothing changed here but uh we agreed to compare the uh the r squares right so uh, since I removed one of my predictors, the multiple R squared will go down, right? You add variables, R squared goes up. You remove variables, R squared goes down. So let's see. It was 0.3339, and now it is 0.3918, right? So it did go up. Did it go up by a lot? No. Uh, the influence is in decimals, right? It's in like third decimal, right? So it used to be 39.4% and now it is 39.2%. So the decrease is really small, okay? But what happened to adjusted R squared? Let's take a look. Adjusted R squared was 0.375. And now that I removed a useful, a blue, useless variable, right? It went slightly up, up 0.3793, right? So uh, again, adjusted R squared behaves like this, okay? If you add useless variable, adjusted r squared goes down and therefore if you remove a useless variable the adjusted r squared will go up and that's what happened right it went up again a little bit not not a lot but that is an indication that our sat uh, score was not contributing to the model it was a junk variable that does not really add much to the accuracy of the model okay 
So that's another way how you can sort of informally judge if the variable is contributing or not. One thing is you look at the p-value. If p-value is high, that means that this variable really is not significant. Another way to look at that is if you remove that variable, your R squared will not move by much. Okay. Now, what I want to do now is illustrate for you what will happen if I now remove an important variable such as, for example, high school GPA, okay? According to my p-value, high school GPA is very significant, right? It has very small p-value. So, let me go ahead and remove that, and let me... Uh, so, this model essentially is a simple linear regression, right? I'm saying that I will predict the university GPA based on just the number of hours in extracurriculum activities, during the high school years. So it became essentially simple linear regression. Okay, I'm going to run this model, run the summary, and look what happened in the summary. My adjusted R squared before was 0.379. Now that I removed high school GPA, it's, two, uh, it's 0.218. It lost a huge amount of uh, accuracy, right? And same same thing thing happened by the way with just regular multiple R squared. Okay, it it uh, went down from thirty nine to twenty two percent. Okay, so uh, if you remove insignificant variable, adjusted R squared goes down a little bit, barely. Okay, but if you remove a significant variable, then you will see big drop like in this case. Right, so. I'm going to put uh, back all of my variables. Um, all right, so let me put high school GPA back and also SAT, even though it's not really contributing anything, right? Okay, so I'm going to run this line. All right, so this is uh, how we evaluate if the model was uh, making, uh, if, if the model uh, has a good fit with the data or not so good fit with the data. So this model is fairly decent. 40% um, R squared. Uh, nothing too special, though. Okay, so therefore, I wouldn't be uh, too reliant if I was working at the university admissions office. I wouldn't be relying too much on that specific model. Okay, it's not super great. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, now let's discuss um, conditions that we have to uh, satisfy, that we have to check in order for this model to be even useful, right? So, uh, as we uh, discussed at the beginning of the last lecture, they're mostly related uh, to residuals, to the errors, right? So, let's calculate residuals. And in the previous uh, lecture, I believe I showed you two different ways how the residuals can be calculated, right? Way number one, uh, I can simply go ahead and... Uh, two steps, right? So, I can run predictions, right? So, predicted... Uh, university GPAs, GPA, okay, and how do I run predictions? Very simple, I use the function predict, okay, and I say predict using my multiple linear regression, all right, so that gives me a hundred numbers, so if I um, show the predictions, it gives me 100 observations, so for each and every person, in my data set, which is a very small data set, by the way, only 100 numbers, right? 100 students. It took their um, high school GPAs, their SAT scores, and their activity hours, plugged them into these equations, and calculated for each and every one of them a predicted university GPA, right? So, for example, for the first student in my data set, he's predicted, or her, whoever that is, predicted university GPA was 2.473. Right, at the end of their junior year in university. Um, or alternatively, so this is one, uh, oh, oh, well, the, I, I just computed the predictions, right, but not the errors. So now I can calculate residuals. Uh, I don't spell them right. Residuals, right, like this. Residuals. Um, as difference between uh, my actual values and they come from GPA data oh. column university GPA, that's the actual university GPA, minus predicted university GPA, which has, I just calculated, right? All that stuff, okay? So this will uh, subtract 
uh, real minus the predicted, and that will give me the error by how much I was wrong. So I run this line. Let's take a look at residuals. All right, so it calculates 100 residuals, right? So my first residual was positive. That means that I underpredicted the first person's GPA by 0.6 roughly. That one was negative, so I overpredicted by roughly 0.39. <coughs> and the rest of them have the same interpretation, right? So this is kind of how I can calculate residuals. Alternatively, I can do it in one line. I can say residuals equal to, and I showed you a couple of lectures ago, there is a built-in function called resid, which is an abbreviation for residuals, I'm guessing, and I'm just saying use the model multiple linear regression. And I run this line, and again, if I want to type residuals out, it gives me pretty much same same stuff right so either way <coughs> you can go a long way like this or you can go short way using just one uh, one line doesn't matter okay so uh, first things first let's calculate uh, let's let's plot the histogram right HIST so the histogram should tell me that the average residual is zero right the average error that I'm making in my predictions is zero uh, and also a histogram should look like a normal distribution. So let's look at histogram of residuals. Uh, yeah. Well, the average is zero, all right, I think. But it's not the most normal thing in the world, right? Looks more like peak one and peak two. Okay. Uh, that's not too promising. But, of course, we need to consult with uh, best authorities on the subject matter, and that would be a Mr. Shapiro-Wilk, right? So, let's run the Shapiro-Wilk test on residuals. Okay, let's see what he says. Uh-huh, so 0 0.13. So, reminder, right, what I'm testing in Shapiro-Wilk test. Now, hypothesis is that the data are normal, alternative data are not normal, okay? And as we discussed many times, for Shapiro-Wilk test, I'm going to use my standard significance level of 5%. So, p-value 0.139 is higher than 0.05, therefore, I fail to reject the null, and the data, uh, histogram may not necessarily be convincing, right? Uh, but data are normally distributed, statistically normally distributed, okay? So, uh, therefore, I'm still okay. Oh, all right, so, normality is verified. Now, let's take a look at the residual plots, right? <coughs> and uh, when I'm uh, looking at the residual plots, it's actually a good idea. So, on the vertical axis, I'm going to plot residuals always. But it's a good idea that on the horizontal axis, I'm going to try different things. Um... For example, in this case, I have three different predictors, right? So I can plot residuals versus each one of them. I can plot the residuals versus the actual GPA, university GPA, versus predicted university GPA. I'm trying to see if any of the residual plots uh, indicate that I may have an issue, okay? So, uh, all right. And how do we... Uh, so residual plot essentially is a scatter plot, right? Um, so I'm going to plot... Uh, for X, I'm going to use first, let's do the SAT scores, and they come from our GPA data, right? SAT, and uh, Y will always be residuals themselves. Residuals. Okay, so here is my residuals plot. It's actually not bad, right? Uh, so what I'm looking for is some sort of the patterns, right? So any pattern would be kind of a red flag, okay? Trends going up or down, curves, um, anything like that. That's one thing, right? Uh, and another thing is I'm looking at the thickness of my residuals plot. So if I see the variability uh, of these points, their spread is decreasing or increasing, then that would be uh, an indication that I might have heteroskedasticity, which is also not a good sign. But this is uniform uh, plot, right? Random cloud of points, around uh, zero on average, so I'm pretty happy with this. 
Okay, so now copy paste. I told you that good programmer should be lazy, right? Copy paste. Now instead of SATs, I'm going to use high school GPA as my horizontal variable. Um, man, it's not the bad. Uh, it's not bad, right? I don't see any um, big um, bad issues. So same thing. Uh, no patterns. Roughly speaking, uniform thickness, right? Okay. So then I'm going to use uh, what's the last one? Uh, activities, right? Activities as my uh, x variable. All right. Now uh, some people may say, "Whoa, what what is that?" Right? So there are like big gaps. What? How? Why? Well, it's very simple, really. Okay. Uh, the reason why my previous plots were uh, more like a random clouds, so it's like uh, more like a scatter plot, looking like a scatter plot, right? With jitter. Uh, is uh, it's versus high school GPA. High school GPA is continuous, right? So it can take any value, and that's what we see, right? But uh, a number of activity hours cannot be integer, right? So it's either zero or one or two or three or four, etc. See, somebody even had up to ten hours of activities, right? Self-reported. That's why you don't see plots uh, for, for example, values for 4.5 hours or 6.6, .6, something like that. They're all integers, right? So, but aside from that. If I'm looking at the pattern, again, no trends, no lines, nothing unusual, right? Uh, uniform thickness, so no heteroscedasticity. Well, let me go take it one step further, right? I'm going to plot residuals versus the university GPA. How about that? Ah, so now I have some weird stuff a little bit going on, right? So now you can see that's kind of a pattern, right? Um, uh, so uh, I don't see p points here or, or or in this quadrant, right? And it looks like there is a trend, right? So what does that tell me? It tells me that if I am predicting, uh, I'm I'm using this model for students with low university GPAs, right? On the low end, my errors tend to be negative, right? And when do I have negative errors? When my prediction is higher than the actual data because the residual, the error is actual minus predicted. If it's negative, predicted is bigger, right? So I'm over predicting the university GPAs for those students who will in actuality um, uh, achieve low GPAs, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, I have st for students with high GPA from the university, right? All the errors are positive, right? So that means that actual is higher than the predicted. So I'm under predicting for them, right? So my model has this feature, right? So each time when I use this model, I should be aware that if I'm predicting uh, that the university, uh, I'm uh, well. Let 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 me actually do this. Uh, let's uh, do another plot, but now uh, instead of actual university GPA, I'm going to use predicted university GPA, right? Because at the moment when I accept students, I don't know what their GPA is going to be at the end of their junior year, right? It's not until two years from that time that I will know that. So it's kind of okay um, for students with low future university GPA, I'm over predicting. Okay, great, but I don't know who is going to get low university GPA. It's not in yet. But I do know how, how my model behaves with uh, but I do know what my model uh, predicts, right? Uh, so therefore, on. therefore over here I can go ahead and use predicted university GPA. All right. Okay, so this one, yeah, this is well behaved, right? So therefore, um, no, no, no real issues here. Okay, so. That's how I uh, uh, I need to use my uh, scatter plots, right, in order to kind of informally judge the um, uh, the quality of my model and any possible issues with model applicability. Okay, so uh, but let's now discuss another uh, test. I shouldn't call it test, probably another um, condition that I have to check. Uh, before I sign off on, on that model. And this condition is called multicollinearity. So what exactly is multicollinearity? 
uh, this is my model right here okay so my university GPA is predictor oh, is the target and predictors are high school GPA SAT and number of uh, hours in extracurricular activities okay excellent um, my predictors are also called independent variables and when I say independent what what are they independent from allegedly they're independent from each other so in other words SAT does not affect uh, is not uh, correlated with high school GPAs and uh, high school GPAs are not correlated with uh, activity hours right so I'm looking for my predictors to be independent from each other now that brings us back to about three lectures ago remember when we just started discussing the simple linear regression we said uh, how do you evaluate if uh, two variables, two numerical variables, are correlated or not with each other. Uh, one depend on another, right? We calculate the coefficient of correlation. Okay? And uh, we even came up with the informal schema to judge, right? So we said that if the coefficient of correlation is close to plus 1 or minus 1, specifically it's between minus 0.7 and minus 1, or plus 0.7 and plus 1, then we're going to call it strong. If it's between minus 0.3 and minus 0.7, or plus 0.3 and plus 0.7, I'm going to call it moderate. And if it's between minus 0.3 to plus 0.3, so it's around zero correlation, then we're going to call it weak correlation, right? So, in this case, here's what I'm looking for, okay? If any of my predictors are strongly correlated with each other, that means that the absolute value of the coefficient of correlation is going to be uh, close to close to one either on negative or on the positive side doesn't matter so in other words uh, is it higher than plus 0.7 or lower than minus 0.7 then these variables are strongly correlated with each other and I cannot call them uh, independent okay and if that happens then my model potentially suffers from the condition called multicollinearity okay so I'm going to show you how I'm going to check for multicollinearity and for that actually I'm going to need to introduce you ladies and gents to another very powerful feature of R that we didn't use before okay in our very first lecture if you remember we discussed the fact that R together with another uh, programming tool called Python are two most powerful data analytics slash statistical uh, tools currently at least okay and I even explained to you why is that right I said that the reason uh, the R package that we looked at so far I mean we, we always used functions that uh, that were built into the R right all these things that we used today even okay LM function uh, predict function uh, reset function they're part of the R package, okay? And R is not all that powerful by itself. Okay, so it, it can do stuff, certainly, but uh, it can do anything and everything. So what makes R uh, powerful is the fact that uh, there is a big ecosystem of external packages that were built by all kinds of people, by programmers, by, you know, data analytics people who just needed something for themselves, they build it and then they made it available to the world, right? By companies, I'm sure there are companies that build packages, okay? All these packages were created and made available for public use and at no charge, okay? So, therefore, here is what I'm going to demonstrate uh, to you, okay? Uh, how I can bring the external package uh, in order to check for multi-collinearity. Here is how we install the packages, okay? So, uh, in this specific case, so I'm going to put a comment here, okay? check for multi collinearity using uh, gg alley package so capital g capital g alley package all right so here is how simple it is to install an external package i'm just going to start typing install 
and it says you have two things right install packages that does the installation and installed packages that lists for you packages that are installed oh well, i want this first one install package and because the name of the package is a text i have to put it in quotation marks capital g capital g alley gg alley okay and here's what will happen when i hit the enter i hit enter well i already installed it so it says do you want to uh, restart no i don't want to restart so it'll take some time as you can see uh no it doesn't take any time because i already installed it right so i'm gonna say yes all right yeah there you go so uh essentially whoa that sucks it just restarted on me okay let's run it again install all right yeah so this is what install looks like it starts downloading uh the uh the packages so it, it, it didn't uh go through the full installation on my machine because I already installed this package but you will see probably packages being downloaded uh, downloaded so it'll take you a minute or so download the full um, package GG alley okay uh, so now uh, an alternative by the way here's another way how I can install the package so instead of typing install package I could uh, go through packages right here click the button install and uh, just type install no no no, no. gg alley gg uh, and it will give me the full list so gg alley i pick from the list and click the install button it will do exactly the same thing right i'm not going to do that so now this package uh, was downloaded from the internet quite literally from the internet and installed on my on, on my machine right here okay now i have to load that in the active memory so i'm going to stay uh, uh, again, we ne never did that before. Library, and the name of the library is GG Alley, like this. And you have to run this uh, this line, okay? So uh, loading package. I, I I don't know what that means, quite frankly. Hopefully, it did install the package. All right. Um, Okay, so now I can use all the functions uh, that are supplied within the package GG Alley that were not supplied within R, okay, originally. And I'm going to use the function GG Pairs. So as I start typing GG Pairs, and you can even see that, okay? Uh, so as I start typing GG Pairs, it says GG Alley, right? So that means that this function does not come from R, it comes from the package which I just installed and loaded. Okay, so GG pairs. And uh, for GG pairs, here's what uh, I'm, I'm just going to do straight up uh, my data set. Okay, so first I'm going to say check all the mutual pair correlations in my data set, which is called GPA data. All right, I'm going to run this line. And it should plot me. Error. Object not found. Oh, I know why it's not found. It's not found because you remember when my uh, R session crashed, it restarted, so therefore my data is lost. So I have to read the data again. And now I can run this, uh, this uh, specific line. And there you go. So let's discuss what is that. You can see that uh, this is a matrix, right? of mutual correlations well and also scatter plots so here on the top and also on the side i have all my variables inside the um inside the uh package inside the data frame uh, gpa data right i have university gpa high school gpa sat activities university gpa high school sat activities beautiful okay this is roughly speaking shape of the distribution for my university gpa so you can think of that as smoothed histogram okay so it's kind of skewed to the right okay you have a whole bunch of students probably with low gpas and then fewer students with high gpas high school gpas are roughly symmetrical right sat scores are roughly symmetrical they don't look normal but that's okay not looking for normal activities um 
you can see that uh, a lot of people with zero activity hours, right? Uh, even more people with like medium up to five activity hours and then after five it starts to drop which makes sense okay but my uh, point of attention is right here okay these are mutual coefficients of correlations right and these are by the way a scatter plot so this one is on the intersection of university GPA versus high school GPA okay so this is quite literally a scatter plot so I can see that as high school GPA goes up right high school GPA is vertical so therefore as high school GPA goes up I can see that my uh, university GPA also goes up so there is a correlation right how strong is the correlation well it's right here it's the correlation between high school GPA and university GPA so for the scatter plot coefficient of correlation is 0.589 right similarly correlation between uh, university GPA and SAT is 0.0 zero three five so this is weak right uh and coefficient between activities and university gpa is 0.476 so these two are moderate high school gpa and activities with university gpa are moderately correlated but that's not what i'm looking for okay in fact i'm going to make the statement like this i want all of my predictors to be strongly correlated with my target because that's what makes them good predictors strong correlation with the target okay so therefore uh, I'm not even going to look at this line all right what I want to look at is cross correlations between predictors themselves so let me go ahead and modify my function call right here okay so here's what I'm going to do I'm gonna say I want to exclude the variable university GPA from the consideration in the function gg pair so i want to cut out essentially this uh, first row entirely why again because it's the correlation of my predictors with the target okay it's fine to be strongly correlated in fact i i prefer my predictors to be strongly correlated when i'm checking for multi-collinearity i'm looking for my predictors to be not strongly correlated among themselves so target has nothing to do with multicollinearity. I'm checking how my predictors are correlated with each other. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, remove the university GPA from the my target, right, from the set. How do I do that? Well, I'm gonna say uh, columns, columns equal. So I'm going to say to tell the function GG pairs which columns in my data set to include so it's going to be c right it's going to be a vector of names so c stands for uh combine right so the first column to include is high school gpa hs underscore gpa next column it's comma separated sat and the next column is comma separated again uh what's it called activities all right that's it right only predictors i don't include the target so i'm running this line and it will redraw the uh, matrix for me note that university gpa is not a part of the picture anymore right it's high school gpa sat activities high school gpa sat activities right okay so what i'm looking for are strong correlations and if i find a strong correlation between any predictor and any other predictor then i have multicollinearity, which is a problematic uh condition okay so sat with high school gpa how is the correlation minus 0 0.005 no correlation right extremely weak which is a good sign activities with high school gpa 0 0.49 0 0.5 right when when uh, when do we start uh, suspecting that stuff when the correlation uh, becomes either plus 0 0.7 or minus 0 0.7 right the closer it is to plus or minus one the worse right 0.5 what I have right now is not bad so this is moderately correlated not strong correlated so that is okay how about activities with uh, SAT minus 0 0.0337 so very weak correlation which is a good sign right so what conclusion do I make well I make conclusion that none of my predictors are strongly correlated among themselves right therefore my model does not have multi-collinearity which is a good thing that means that i can treat my predictors as truly independent from each other 
no multi-collinearity, so the model is good from that standpoint as well. Okay, again, I, I'm excluding the target, right, by specifying exactly which columns to include in my uh, analysis of cross correlations. Okay, again, because I want my predictors to be strongly correlated with target. The stronger, the better. Okay, if I find something, some predictor that is highly correlated with target with a big likelihood it's a significant predictor so when i run the this test uh, on this uh, on this variable it will likely have very low p value so that the slope is not zero okay so the essentially the name of the game when you're creating the linear regression model is to come up with a variable that will have a strong correlation with your target okay because this is going to be a good useful significant predictor variable that will improve your r squared and it will make your model to be uh, more useful okay so when it comes to multi-collinearity we exclude the predictor variables but we start we we, we check co correlations of predictors among themselves